I think I can say, I'm gonna say a couple of brief things about, uh, uh, about uh, the plan, but uh, our experts here are going to have a much more uh, elaborate and nuanced uh, discussion of that. And we will then go, after they give brief presentations, go to the audience for questions and discussion as well. But I think I could say that there are three general parts of this uh, uh, very ambitious uh, plan. One is uh, there is a component of tuition-free uh, higher education, public higher education. Uh, and again, it starts at $85,000 of family income, and then it graduates up uh, in the coming years to $125,000. There's a portion that's about refinancing existing loans and, and uh, debt. Obviously, the debt crisis is a major component of this uh, effort, uh, an effort to relieve student debt. Um, and uh, there is an element, and I don't know if we'd say it's major, but uh, of cracking down on bad actors on the for-profit sector, which is one of the big drivers of, of student debt, not the only uh, one at, at all. Um, and I think the other thing just to say is this, if this was successful, which is a big if, and we'll talk about that some, uh, uh, it would really be a major redefinition of the federal role in higher education in the United States, perhaps equivalent to something like the Higher Education Act of 1965, perhaps a little bit like the GI Bill, which was, again, the kind of the pattern that set the structure of how we've approached financial aid in the United States by giving it to individuals, and not to institutions. At least that was the original concept. So this is a different structural model. Uh, and then maybe another, I could even say it's in the ballpark of the Morrill Act of 1865 in terms of the amount of money involved. Um, and uh, so any, in any case, uh, if it was to actually happen, it would be a really significant uh, change in, in um, American higher education. Um, and all I could say too though is promises, 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 uh, because it's also, I think we could say, uh, if you know the evolution of this plan, uh, a play for votes, uh, particularly with lower, uh, I'm sorry, with the younger people and lower income people as, as well. So there's a lot of uh, interesting aspects of this proposal. Uh, and so we're, we have, I'm really pleased that we have two really uh, uh, significant people who are very knowledgeable about student debt and higher education finance. And uh, we're going to start off with uh, Don, uh, uh, Don, I'm sorry, we're starting off with Bob, sorry, <laughs> with um, uh, um, Bob Shireman. Bob has, uh, uh, is a senior fellow at the Century Foundation working on education policy with a focus on for-profit college accountability, quality assurance, and consumer protections. He served on the Bill Clinton White House as a senior policy advisor to, Na to the National Economic Council and later for the Obama administration as deputy undersecretary in the Department of Education. Uh, he is, uh, was a key person in shepherding the evolution of the nation's income-based student loan repayment system from its initial adoption in 1992 to an expansion improvement under the Obama administration and many, many other things. Bob is a big player. You may have seen uh, he's written in the Wall Street Journal about uh, student debt and uh, about the specifically the Hillary, Hillary's plan. Uh, and then, I, uh, uh, again, very pleased to have uh, Don Heller uh, join us. He is now the uh, provost and executive vice president, so if I have that. Vice president. Vice president, sorry, of uh, in, the University of San Francisco. Uh, he got here about six, seven, eight months ago in that position. Uh, before that time, he uh, you know, has a long history of, as a teacher and researcher in the area of educational economics, public policy, and finance, with a primary focus on the issues of college access uh, choice and success for low-income and minority students. Prior to his appointment at uh, at our 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 uh, uh, university across the bay, uh, not Stanford, the the good one, <laughs> the good one, um, uh, the poor one. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Pat Brown graduated from uh, USF, yep. so it's uh, well, it's not. Uh, as esteemed uh, alumni. Um, uh, before coming to San Francisco, he was the Dean of the College of Education at Michigan State, and earlier appointments included the Director of the Center for Study of Higher Education and uh, Professor of Education at Penn State, and then also in affiliation with the University of Michigan, again, a very accomplished person, so we're really pleased to, to have them both. I'm just gonna say the final things. I, I, I put a couple of questions to them. 
they're going to talk whatever they want to talk about because that's the way it works. <laughs> but uh, uh, in their first kind of eight to 10 minutes of an intro and then we'll go out, as I said, to discussion. These are the things I, I, propose, I put forth to them. What are the known details of the Clinton plan? How would it work and what will it cost? Uh, uh, you know, I think we're still, if you've tried to look uh, online and understand this or hear uh, the campaign um, uh, uh, materials and uh, things that Hillary has said on the campaign trail, it's a little hard to understand. Um, what would it mean for California public higher education? Uh, who is it and who is for it and who is against the proposal in its present form? Uh, I think there's some issues for the private higher education nonprofit sector, obviously. And what is the possibility that it will pass in its present form? And what might it actually come out like if perhaps, let's say, the Democrats actually you know, get even or can actually control the Senate? The House seems impossible. But OK, so with that, uh, 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 Don is going to, uh, I'm Bob. sorry, Bob, sorry. I did that again. Sorry, <laughs> Bob is going to start off. Great. Thank you, John. Um, but let me give some background on, on uh, the plan overall. And um, I think it's helpful to look back at a couple of things that happened in the 1970s uh, when I was going to high school. Um, one is that the earnings from having a high school diploma collapsed in our economy. We basically had uh, the, the, the end of the high school diploma as the thing that would help you enter the middle class. So you had a change in really what higher education means to people. It, it, be, it, be, it went from something that felt optional to something that feels mandatory. Um, the other thing that happened was that at the federal level, the federal government Made, had, had previously had kind of a balanced approach where there were um, substantial aid programs that were about institutions, states, things like the Morrill Act. Um, uh, then you had some voucher-like uh, support uh, like the GI Bill, but it was built on a foundation of institutions and states having a responsibility to develop and guide the higher education systems um, all across the country. What happened in the 1970s is that it turned significantly toward voucher type funding to students. So at the same time that higher education uh, became something that felt mandatory to people, it also became something where the perception changed to this is something you buy for yourself. This is like a product, a car or something else that you're going to go out there and buy. Um, I think that has contributed a lot to kind of the frustration around higher education because it's just feeling like, like this is something that I have to make sure happens for my kids or they're not going to have a secure future. And you're telling me that this is something that I have to go out there and buy as opposed to really the feel in the before the 1970s was this is something that as we advance as a society and we need more and more education for people to fill all of the roles that we need in society, that this is something that we as a society figure out how to make happen for for everybody. Not that it's going to be easy for anyone, but that it's something that is a, a shared responsibility. And over time, that has really shifted to you can really hear um, even the you know, strong supporters of higher education very much talk about it like, like it's a product that people buy and we need to uh, help them to go, uh, to go buy it rather than that kind of a, a shared responsibility. I think this has contributed to uh, the rise of problem for-profit colleges, predatory practices where you've got people going out there and saying, you know, we'll, you know this is the route to a high paying job. Uh, don't worry about the debt that you're taking on. Those kinds of things that again come from that kind of, uh, that kind of a feel. Um, it also uh, led to, contributed to states uh, being off the hook in terms of financing higher education. It meant that when states ran into trouble, ran into budget difficulties, instead of, instead of saying, well, maybe we shouldn't build so many prisons, or maybe we should go back to taxpayers because it's important for us to have a strong higher education system, it made it easier for them to say, well, we can charge some tuition 
charge even more tuition because there's Pell Grants, there's student loans that can contribute to that. So I'm not saying that Pell Grants and student loans necessarily cause tuition increases, but it facilitates state decisions about financing higher education in ways that, that you know, it's hard to know what would have happened in the absence of things, but um, it looks pretty likely that the reason that states felt more comfortable cutting higher education rather than cutting other things or rather than making other difficult decisions, um, it, it became, that became the way to balance the budget. So a lot of the tuition increases that we've seen have been because of that, because of the cut in, um, in federal support. So we went from a kind of a balanced approach that leaned heavily in toward institutional and state responsibility to, to higher education to one that um, leans very heavily in the direction of voucher support that, that basically is telling students and families, you've got to figure it out. We've got some tools to help you, but you've got to, got to figure it out. The crux of Hillary Clinton's plan is to rebuild the foundation around institutional and state responsibility and accountability for higher education in the United States. And that's why her plan is called a, a compact. And frankly, the reason that it has felt like, oh, it's complicated and we don't know how to explain it. I mean, you, you know, says the word compact, what does that mean? Um, and what that, but what that means is states have a responsibility. And if states want a big chunk of money, and she has paid for in her budget $500 billion over 10 years of support for states and, and past student loan borrowers for a piece of it, um, to, to lure states back into their role of financing higher education. And it is, an, a, it is a deal with the states. It's not just here's the money and keep charging whatever you want, is you have to make higher education affordable. You have to enroll a good cross-section of, of America. Of, uh, you have got to make sure you're enrolling low-income students if you want this support from, um, from the federal government. And it has to be affordable. The, the shorthand for the whole plan has been tuition free, debt free. That's what the affordability is about. Um, and you know, even an article, I think it was yesterday, uh, in the Wall Street Journal implied that that would just mean we just throw a whole bunch of money at, at, uh, at institutions and whatever they do with it is, is fine. Uh, uh, you know, and tuitions would increase. But to, to say that tuitions will increase because of the plan ignores, ignores the structure of the plan, which is you have to agree to the affordability um, uh, strictures, so tuition and debt, if you want the money from the federal government at the, at the state level. Um, so states have to be and institutions need to be focused on making sure that their, their plans promote upward mobility low income enrollment as well as middle income and, and others and in the state. states could opt out, correct? And Just states like could opt out. Now the goal is to start with states where they are and move them in the right direction. And we know that you know, California is, is well poised to uh, be able to, California has been one of the better states in terms of financing higher education, especially in the, in the last few years, kind of coming out of the recession, uh, the, the millionaire's tax helped to make sure that, that uh, California higher education was um, uh, you know, coming back faster than some of the other states uh, were. Um, there are some other states that it, it would be harder for, they couldn't just in one year jump to where, where California is. So the idea is that they would, um, they would have to make progress, but they're starting further behind in, in terms of where, uh, where their funding is. We have a chance for Don yeah, to absolutely. Yeah, Let's go for because it. we'll come back yeah, to your absolutely. other points. And your questions, so, I mean, I figure we'll get to those in the discussion. That's great. Okay, so we're going to now, Don's going to do something here. We'll try to get out of the way. Well, thanks, John, for the invitation to be here. It's nice to have a chance to take my provost hat off and dealing with all of those issues to be a little bit of a researcher for a few minutes. So I appreciate the invitation to be here. Um, you're going to see through um, my slides some of the things I'm saying that I'm not a huge fan of, uh, of Hillary's uh, proposal, and I'll tell you a little bit why, and then we can talk more about that in the Q&A. And before we draw analogies, or the analogies that John drew to uh, the Morrell Act and Abraham Lincoln and the GI Bill and Harry Truman and the Higher Education Act and Lyndon Johnson, we got to get Hillary elected before we can <laughs> put her up there on Mount Rushmore with those other three presidents. So um, unless anybody gets overconfident, I have one word for you, Brexit. 
to think about happen with that vote. So um, I'm going to start off by um, talking about student loans. This is a topic that probably gets more attention in the media than uh, almost any other these days is the impact of student loans. You've all seen the data, $1.3 trillion in outstanding loans. Uh, crisis is the word that's often used. Students are drowning in debt. Uh, students are working as baristas if they can get a job at all, living in their parents' basement and saddled by debt. We've all seen this, and here are just some examples from the media. Uh, this is Consumer Reports a few weeks ago. Uh, I kind of ruined my life by going to college. Uh, $152,000 in debt for a bachelor's degree. Uh, CNN, a uh, woman who borrowed over $100,000 for a bachelor's degree and trying to figure out how to pay it back. And before you think it's the fringe media like Consumer Reports and, and uh, CNN, here we have the old gray lady herself, the New York Times, who about five years ago ran a four-part series this opening piece was Sunday Times, a lead top of the, above the fold, uh, and here's a young woman who borrowed $120,000 to earn her bachelor's degree and was working as a waitress. And this is the dominant story you hear about student debt. Now, the problem with focusing on these kinds of examples would be as if uh, the San Francisco Chronicle was going to do a story about college students today, and they went and interviewed Bob and John and me as typical college students. Well, yeah, you can go onto a college campus and find a 50-something, I'm guessing, I'm talking about myself now, a 50-something person who's sitting there trying to earn a bachelor's degree, but we're not the norm by any means, and nor are these people who've been singled out in the media for these kinds of stories about the student debt crisis, nor are they the norm by any means. So let me show you some, <clears throat> some data to actually back this up. So these are data from the National Post-Secondary Student Aid Study. They're about, um, about four or five years outdated, but I'm going to tell you at the end why they're still very relevant. And this is the student loan debt of graduating seniors in that year. So these are students who are graduating uh, from university and how much they had borrowed to get their bachelor's degree. So first of all, uh, that says sell range and value, and what that should say is 31%. Um, <laughs> and that's people who did not borrow. And luckily, I brought a copy of my slides so that I can see what the numbers actually are. So almost a third of students had no student loan debt when they graduated. And you don't hear about them at all. Okay? All you hear about are the people with $100,000 worth of loan debt. Almost a third of students getting bachelor's degrees had no loan debt whatsoever. Uh, the red is those borrowing less than, than $6,000, 5.5%. Luckily, you can get an idea of the proportions here. The green is uh, 6,000 to 15,000, 12 percent. So you can see about half of the people either had no borrowing or borrowed less than $12,000 to earn their bachelor's degree. The purple is uh, 15 to 25,000, that's 15 percent. And the light blue is 25 to 35,000, another 15 percent. Orange is 35 to 50, 12 percent. And we will put a copy of these slides. I'll give them to John for the, and I'll have them on my website that will have the actual numbers in here. Um, and then the brown is 50 to 75, 7 percent. The little reddish slice is 75 to 100,000, 1.3 percent. And here's where we want to go, which is those who borrowed $100,000 or more, that little slice there is one half of 1 percent. So those are the people who borrowed a bachelor's degrees. When you read articles about people with six-figure student loan debt, they are almost exclusively and disproportionately people who borrowed for professional schools, doctors, lawyers, dentists, vets, et cetera, occasionally MBAs. Okay? So this is the reality. The median student loan debt was $26,000 of people who graduated in that year. Uh, and if you were taking those out in subsidized loans, it would be about $182 a month to pay them back. And only just to add, because that's those who borrowed. That's just those who borrowed, yeah. If you included Not those who borrows. didn't, the median would be much lower. And borrowing has actually decreased since 2011-12. The College Board just came out with their Trends in Student Financing report this morning, and the total student loan volume uh, from the federal government has gone down 15 18% since 2011-12. So these numbers, I think, are still very relevant. There may be a little bit of shift in here. But the important message here is that there's a small percentage of students who are borrowing a large amount of money to earn a bachelor's degree. Okay, so what do students really pay for college? 
So these are students in community colleges, and these are data, again, from that same NIPSAS survey five years ago. And just to give you a benchmark, tuition prices in community colleges have gone up about 17 or 18 percent since then. So you could increase and inflate these numbers if you wanted by about 17, 18 percent. So in Hillary's initial target range for students who are going to get free tuition, zero to 85,000, right now students are paying nothing in net tuition. And that's because they have enough grants to cover, in fact, not just their tuition, but some of their living costs. 69% uh, of community college students with incomes below $85,000 have less than $1,000 in net tuition that they're paying. So effectively, the students who she's targeting, for the most part, are not paying tuition right now when you take into account the grant aid. Though I think as Bob has pointed out in some of his pieces, the plan would allow them to use some of the free money that they're getting to pay for living costs as well, or allow them to pay, put a Pell Grant, for example, towards living costs is the way it would work. Uh, and you can see the equivalent amount for those who are in the next range when Hillary moves up to 125,000 and those who make 125,000 would not be eligible. Four-year public universities, here are the same amounts. Again, that target range, that first target range, people with incomes below $85,000, right now they're paying less than $1,000 in net tuition. Uh, and 63%, almost two-thirds of them are paying a net tuition of less than $3,000 a year. I just need to interject. One yeah. thing is that, uh, because this is a point of discussion about how this fits into California, and we talked about it briefly and when we talk, discussed, you see returns about 33% of all yep. tuition aid. Uh, and so the, the net effect, which is similar to what he's showing here, is that 50% of the students, undergraduates, at UC pay no tuition at all. Yep. So they're basically already matching of uh, the Clinton right. goals, then the question is how that fits, and Bob's going to talk about how that fits in the California yep. component of it. So, so let, let me get to some comments about um, the new college compact, as Hillary is calling it. Um, my biggest problem is that there's potential for huge consumer surplus, and this is a term economists use to say that you're putting money in the pockets of people who would have been willing to buy a good on their own, even without the subsidy. Um, there's little evidence that wealthier students, and I'm not talking about you know, Mark Zuckerberg's kids. I'm talking about people from incomes that we would, most of us would agree would be upper middle class, you know, above the median of about $60,000 a year, uh, but well below what a lot of people think of as wealthy. Well, there's little evidence that these people are being priced out of college right now. There's also little evidence that cutting interest rates, which Hillary has also proposed to do, would have any impact whatsoever on college access or completion. Uh, no evidence that I've seen, credible evidence, that people would respond by being more likely to go to college if their interest rates were cut from the current 3.76% to 2%, or pick whatever figure. So the other problem I have is that you know, there's an estimated cost of about $50 billion a year. I think Hillary originally said it was less, and one of the think tanks priced it out at $65 billion a year. Let's settle on $50 billion, because what's $5 billion between friends, right? So my concern is, what is the opportunity cost? If, in fact, she can identify funding for this through taxes on the wealthy, raising taxes on the wealthy or other sources, what are some other things we could be doing with the money? Well, for example, we could expand the Pell Grant program, which is a very successfully targeted program. You pretty much can't get a Pell Grant if you're not from below the median income in the country. We could expand Pell to put it more towards covering the full cost of attendance for students, not just tuition. So for example, $30 billion, less than the full amount that she's talking about spending, would cover all of the unmet need. Now, unmet need is, unmet need is the difference between a student's cost of attendance. Cost of attendance is all of the costs, tuition, room, board, books, et cetera, minus their effective family contribution, minus what grant aid they're already getting. So the left, the unmet need that's left, we could cover all of that unmet need for all dependent students in public universities with a family income below the median for about $30,000. In other words, those students could go to college for free without having to pay anything. $35 billion would cover all the unmet need for every community college student in the country, okay? Five, six million of them. Every single community college student could go for free with spend it by spending $35 billion of that $50 billion. And again, you're talking about covering their living expenses, books, transportation, et cetera. For just $10 billion, a relatively small amount, we could expand the TRIO programs. The TRIO programs help students who are first generation prepare for college and then be successful once there. We could expand this program tenfold to be able to serve all of the eligible students who right now are not served because of funding restrictions with $10 billion. All right, 
So what's good about the program? There's plenty good about it. Simplifying FAFSA is good. Uh, easier paths into income-based repayment or income contingent repayment is good. Strengthening gainful employment regs, as John talked about, is good. Also, she's talked about having demo financial aid projects for boot camps and other alternative post-secondary training. Right now, uh, the Department of Ed is just embarking on a demonstration project to allow uh, boot camp participants to be able to access federal financial aid to pay for it, and Hillary is in support of that. That, as I said, strengthening gainful employment. All right, so let me just talk quickly about California. This is tuition in California, uh, the three sectors of higher education in California compared to national averages. Community colleges are very cheap in this state. Even though they're not free like they were 25 years ago, they're still very cheap compared to the rest of the country. Cal State is also cheap. And again, for people living in California who've seen the big run up in tuition in the three sectors, you're still cheap compared to the rest of the nation in the first two sectors. UC, however, not so cheap. UC is more expensive than um, the doctoral universities across the country. California, however, is also much more generous in grant aid. California funds about twice on a per undergraduate basis in the Cal Grant program than the national average. So even though tuition is high in UC, between the money that UC has committed, the third of tuition revenue that they're turning around in institutional grant aid, there's also a very, very rich, compared to most other states, Cal Grant program. And then just to look at um, net prices, because again, we're not concerned just with sticker prices, but what students actually have to pay after accounting for grant aid. Um, again, I took three local examples here. Berkeley City College um, is a little bit more when you look at the cost of attendance now, including tuition, living expenses, books, transportation, a little bit more than the national average. San Francisco State's a little below, and Berkeley is well above the national average. So you know, you're, you're not, on a, on a net basis, as competitive as you are in sticker prices, at least in the first two sectors. And then graduation rates, how does, this, how does, it, how does the, uh, the universities and colleges here perform? Berkeley City College underperforms a national average for a three-year graduation rate in community colleges. San Francisco is under the, rate, under the national rate. And Berkeley, of course, is above the national rate. There's quite a bit of variation across the UC campuses. Um, there are some campuses that are well below the 89% rate for select and public institutions. Berkeley is obviously well above. And with that, I will stop and turn it over back to John for okay, discussion. Okay, great. Maybe you could come and sit down yeah. over here. And what I would say is that uh, I think there has to be some full disclosure for Don because he does represent a private institution. Uh, the, the program uh, that Hillary has is for public higher education, and uh, at least as defined thus far. And there are various studies that show this will push more students away from the privates and into the publics, which is another whole series of questions of how uh, the publics can actually expand uh, capacity for that additional uh, uh, enrollment demand. But I think we should allow Bob. So, so let me just say, okay. I anticipated that comment from John. <laughs> and I just will go on record as saying is before I took the job at USF, I was writing and blogging and critical of Hillary's plan. So I just want to go on record as saying that when I was working at a public university that would have benefited, as I had been similarly critical of President Obama's uh, free community college tuition program. So oh, okay. just to go so on the record. I think we should allow Bob to, to, to respond in some form sure. because he's. Yeah, well, I, and I think it's useful to point out to the room, if it's not already obvious, that here you have a debate between two people who both support spending significant additional federal yeah. dollars Absolutely. on higher education, which is not necessarily representative of the national conversation around this issue. Um, and, um, and I would say that if we could get traction on um, Don's plan, it would be a good plan. Let's increase, let's increase Pell Grants um, and help low-income students more. That would, be, that would be a good step forward. Um, but we, there are bigger issues that we're really grappling with in, in higher education. And I think that, um, I think it's, this feels, just the way the conversation has gone in the nation, it feels like this is an opportune moment to rethink about, about how we treat higher education as a community, as a state, as a nation. I mean, I, um, I live in Berkeley, and I was thinking about this question of, of our public libraries here in Berkeley, and whether we are wasting money by making them available to higher income people like me. And, and you know, we could take that money that I'm, that I'm saving by not paying to go to the library and, and use that for low-income people, but 
I think we wouldn't have libraries if they were, I think just the support of the polity for having libraries would not be there. You know, we, we as a community support libraries because we feel that they, we feel them as a community resource. And I, and I think we are at a turning point, partly just because of the way that higher education, at least on the democratic side of the aisle, has caught fire as an issue. I think we have an opportunity to really rethink how, how we treat it. And um, you know, I would be all for a targeted program that helps low income people go to college, but I think we can do better actually this time around by, by grabbing this moment and, and moving forward with it. Well, just a couple of questions before we go to the audience. And one is that uh, we asked, how would it work in California uh, as an example? Uh, can you, Bob, you're the one who's been kind of dealing with some of these details. And right. sure. as full disclosure, Bob is also an advisor uh, to the Clinton right. administration. So I've had group. some involvement in discussing so, with the campaign how, yeah. how to put all this together. And there are many, many, many details that would be worked out. There are a lot of details up on the website, but there are many more details that we worked out in terms of how something like this would, be, uh, would actually be implemented. I would expect for a place like California, because California is, has generally done a good job, that it would be um, uh, that with some additional inv investment, um, California would be would receive a substantial amount of federal money that could be used to make to help make college more affordable for Californians to expand enrollment in whichever systems make sense to expand enrollment in to create additional alternatives in terms of post-secondary education um, that it would be a contribution to, to California. Now, whether it's whether California gets you know 11% in the first year or whether it's less because some other states that are further behind need some additional support, those would be the kinds of things that would be worked out in, in, in implementation. But um, if you take the, um, it, you know, but, but California would get credit for what it's already done um, and is well positioned to, uh, to take advantage of a plan like this. But this relationship is the federal government is providing funds to the state of California, yes. which we don't have a California Post-Secondary Education Commission anymore. We don't have a yep. capacity at the moment. Uh, supposedly the Department of Finance is supposed to have some of that capacity to right. do these things. That, that is another so, fun so detail. So this big chunk of money comes down. <laughs> Who's gonna make the decisions? No, no, it's, it's a, it's, and the idea, I think, which is, you know, with the Morrill Act was this way. It was, here's, here's an offer of money, and then right. you have to have a plan, right. and you get the plan. So that, that's how that worked that's in California. That's how we have Berkeley, yep. uh, in part. But uh, so I think that this is a huge area. What are states doing? What is their capacity to really uh, provide, one, matching funding, as right. you probably know, discretionary funding is only about 10 or so percent of the state budget, and that's where higher ed sits. So right. there's not a lot of money. You know, I mean, we're a little better off, obviously. So this big chunk of money comes down, and then obviously there's going to be various controls and regulations, because yeah. that's what the federal government Absolutely. does. Absolutely. So any other little insights before I well, ask Well, I mean, Don I think on the question of, of, of a state's capacity, one of the discussions that would occur is, do you take into consideration, I think it makes sense to take into consideration a state's wealth. So a wealthy state that has just decided we're not going, not going to put money into higher education, um, it shouldn't be easy for them to get the federal money. Yeah. But a state that is a poor state, we're going to help them, I think from the federal level, you'd help them more. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think those are, and those are the kinds of details that policy folks will have to grapple with. Well, it would be a major redefinition of the federal role and state role yes, in absolutely. higher ed. Uh, it's quite radical, and I'm not, you know, I mean, I think it's really intriguing. I'm not biased here on that, but so Don, on your side, what would be, you know, you could comment on what Bob said, but also, uh, what do you think might be the eventual outcome? Uh, let's say uh, the Senate gets close to even or something, the Democrats do well in terms of picking up seats. Forget mm -hmm. about the House, I guess. Uh, what do you think might be the net result if Hillary is elected, if? Yeah, so you know this, this issue that Bob brought up of a targeted versus a universal program, this is one of the biggest debates that goes on, historically has gone on for years in um, public policy. 
issues is do you have a benefit, a public benefit, and do you gain political power, or political support for it by making it universal, or do you try to target it at people of need? And the libraries are a great example. Libraries, public libraries have always been free, and we've almost never charged for access to a public library. National defense is free because we haven't figured out a way to charge people for national defense. I would argue that, argue that the universality of free higher education, that horse left the barn decades ago. So we're in a system now where it's not universal, it's not universally free. Everybody pays a different price, almost literally, like flying on an airplane. So I would argue that we already have a system that's very well targeted, and very well targeted in many different dimensions. You've got federal financial aid, you've got Cal grants, you've got institutional grants. So we're already doing a good bit of targeting. So you know, why not take advantage of that? And as far as the argument, about, well, there wouldn't be the support for expanding the Pell Grant program as there would be for a more universal benefit where everybody would gain free tuition. Um, I would argue that actually the Pell Grant program has received a fair amount of bipartisan report, support over the years. We had um, small but steady increases under both the Bush administration uh, and the Obama administration, even in the face of fiscal constraints at the, in the federal budget. Um, and it's historically been well supported by both sides of the aisle. Now, that's not to say that Pell Grant, the purchasing power of Pell Grants hasn't declined over the years. It has quite a bit. But nevertheless, it's a pretty well supported program and it is extremely well targeted at students of need and it eliminates for the most part that consumer surplus. So I'll stop with that and turn it back uh, to you. One other question is California is different than some states. Uh, we're growing in population. Right. This is one yeah. of the big challenges we have. We're always growing. And uh, that's why, you know, when you talk about budget cuts for UC or its difficulties with the budgets, you're also talking about your inability to grow yeah. the system, which has historically been one right. of our great, you yeah. know, achievements, yeah. not just having quality, but growing. Yeah. And uh, we aren't getting any capital funds from uh, the state of California now anymore, or at least UC isn't, and I don't think CSU. So, uh, uh, is that part of the equation in some form, capacity building? Because I would say the eight, in the 1960s, uh, we did have a facilities act by the federal government. I'm in a building which was benefited right. from it. It's a very ugly building, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was free. This it was building, the right price. This yeah. building as well, if I remember, I know there's some people in here will know better than I. I think these last two floors, and the reason there's an elevator that only goes to one floor here is because they suddenly got federal money when they were planning this and said, oh, we'll add two more floors or something like that. Okay, so there was a brief moment in time where there was money for capital. Is that part of the scenario at all, capacity building? I would expect that it would be part of the discussion. It's not part of what's in the plan right now, but obviously something that helps with operating expenses also can help to relieve pressure so that there can be financing of debt for facilities if you need them. So money is fungible in that way, um, even if it you know, remains designed the way that it is now. Mm. Can, I wanted to get to the, your, your political viability question. Absolutely. Should I do that, or do you want to I go want to questions first? I want people to think first? about questions, because uh, I'm going to go to you in just a minute after Bob uh, uh, Yeah, so, you know, I think all, pretty much every issue I've ever worked on, somebody has said, you know, oh, don't bother, like, that, that, that we're, ne we're never going to make any progress on that, or that, the, that bill's not going to happen this year, or whatever. And I went ahead and worked on it and put together all the details, and you know, sure enough, it didn't happen that year, but then like something happened, and there was a moment, like a year or two later, or, and in, in one case, like 13 years later, and a window of opportunity opens, and, and the details got worked out, and the coalition that got built to put it together, boom, it like, it, suddenly that issue becomes doable, becomes possible, and those windows of opportunity are unpredictable, and if you wait for them to happen, to, to, put, to figure out the details and build the coalition, it will be too late by the time when the window opens. You don't have time to do all of that. You have to already have it ready, which is why it's worth working on ideas and coalitions, whether you see how they're going to get passed or not, because you'll be the one ready there uh, to move it forward. And that's the way I feel about this, like whether Congress, you know, assuming Hillary is elected as president, whether Congress is in the Democratic hands or partially or fully in Republican hands, you never know when either during that period or in the next Congress, there's going to be an opportunity where, where there's an opening and you can move something forward. And so you're referring to the direct loan 
uh, direct uh, loans, income-based income repayment. That is an repayment. amazing feat. I mean, right. these were just things that, you know, and fa frankly, like battling for-profit colleges. These are all things. It was like, oh my gosh, the politics are impossible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and we move forward on them. Now, uh, unless you think that Bob learned all of this in the Clinton administration or the Obama <laughs> administration, Bob did his graduate work in public policy right, at, at USF. At USF. So oh. I just want to go on record. So <laughs> oh, he was well-trained. Oh, he was well-trained. It wasn't all on the job training, though. He learned right. quite well, a bit in and, the and I was an undergrad here, so. <laughs> we'll both take credit. Go for it. Okay, so we're going to go to the floor. What I would ask is, okay, I'll recognize the people, and then please state who you are or in something a little bit about your affiliation, and then uh, brief brief questions, please. So right here. No, no, we need we need a recorded because we're this is yeah. So uh, my name is Matt Bozer. I'm a former graduate student here, and I am sometimes on the staff when I've got a contract. <laughs> um, so uh, I have a bachelor's degree, a little bit of graduate work, in excess of $75,000 of student debt. I didn't expect to walk into this room today and be a one percenter. <laughs> um, Congratulations. I didn't, I didn't pay, I didn't borrow all that money to pay tuition. I borrowed that money to pay fees it. and housing. And I find it a little disingenuous to have seen slides that talk about tuition outside of that context. Mm -hmm. Further, the, I got the feeling that you were showing like principles where the full repayment on a given principle is like some dramatic fraction above that, maybe double that. And so it just all these, all the data we saw today seemed to me to be like highly misleading, um, whether or not my situation is representative. So, so let, that, me, let, me, yes. let me explain why very often when you look at studies of, um, uh, for example, elasticities of demand for uh, college tuition, they focus only on tuition and not on living expenses. The reason for that is that people have to live. People have to live somewhere, they have to eat, whether they're going to college or not. So that what's often considered the direct cost of going to college is just the tuition. Now I'll be the first one to admit that living in a dormitory and buying a dining plan is often more expensive than the other options available to students. But those other options are available to most students. And this is why when economists do studies of the impact of rising tuition prices on college or rising costs on college, they focus on tuition prices because that's the direct cost of earning the degree. So that's why, and I did show both cost of attendance, tuition fee, room and board as well. You know, I don't want to negate the difficulty that somebody who borrowed a large sum of money has in paying that back. I mean, there are certainly people who do struggle to pay it back. My point is that we shouldn't be basing public policy, with all due respect, on somebody who borrowed $100,000 to earn a bachelor's degree. And we shouldn't be running around saying, how can we stop that? How can we protect students from that? When first of all, very few students who do, who, very few students do that, and to be honest, those who do have often made very poor choices. And in some of my blog posts about the New York Times article, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you, but some people, when you read the stories, have made very poor choices. And do we want to protect people from making very poor choices? Do we want the federal government to do that? Well, if so, there are lots of other policies we can have discussions about. Bob, Bob do you want to comment on this? Uh, well, I would, I mean, I, ag I agree that the, the media does tend to sort of grab examples that are extreme. On the other hand, that is the way we, are, we learn about issues is we sort of, you know, oh my gosh, look at what, look at what happens. Um, uh, so, but it's, it's, um, you know, the living expenses, by the way, is, is absolutely a big part of the plan, a, a big part of the reason that especially lower income students borrow, and it's critical to address that. You know, in, one thing that uh, wasn't shown on your slides is where people actually go to college. And so in California, over 70% of the students are community college students. Yeah. I don't know if you know that, yeah. but that's, I think, too many. But uh, proportionally, uh, I think in terms of California higher ed, you see rules about five, six percent of all the students in the state. So I'm just only noting those proportionality things. So, so we have a question here. Wait just a minute for the microphone. Then Greg, and then. Hi, um, I'm coming from Far Away. So the Dumpter PhD candidate from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I was wondering um, about the coalitions and processes you mentioned towards the end of the talk. And we know that Hillary Clinton, at the beginning of her campaign, didn't put high priority to higher education, and throughout the primaries, her position has shifted. And in the event of her election, what would be the specific mechanisms or possible coalitions to 
continue the pressure to keep higher education a priority. Right. So in August, a year ago, a year and two months ago, Hillary Plan put out her, Hillary put together and, and announced her detailed higher education plan. It got no attention. So people just didn't know about it. So it is not true that she didn't talk about it. She, it, was, it was a top priorities of, her, of hers from very early on. And there was actually an article in, it was a Huffington Post writer, I think, an extensive article about the process that led to her plan. And all of the people who, I mean, she, her, her top staff people contacted, I don't know if it was 100 people, you know, there were a lot of people who were consulted on it. And those are the kinds of people that would, you know, sort of move it forward, but it would also be the responsibility, assuming she's elected, of her appointees to carry it forward and encourage outside organizations to, um, to get involved in that process. I mean, a critical piece would be trying to rally the Sanders supporters to lobby for this yeah. and put pressure on supporting it on Congress because yeah. that's, that's going to be, you know, that's, that's going to make it or break it. Yeah. And I should say Congress. there is interest um, and there was actually a chunk of money in the plan that's for private colleges, nonprofit private colleges. It was a, a lot of interest in incorporating them. It was hard to figure out how to do it, but I would expect that a, Hil a Hillary Clinton administration w would pull in the private colleges and really talk about how can this how can how can this work with how can they be involved in this plan either as a separate pot of money or as part of the way that states meet their responsibilities. Sounds expensive, uh, Greg, <laughs> and then and then Meg, and then in the back. Go ahead. Thanks, Greg Dubrow from uh, the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. It struck me, Bob, the way you were framing the, your initial remarks is this, I this idea of higher education as a public or private good. Mm -hmm. So, and the way you kind of guided us through is it seemed to have been repositioned as more of a private good than a public right. good. How do we, can we reframe it, reposition it back to being more of a public good? Like, is that possible in this political climate, the anti-tax climate, and everything? And I guess a corollary question for Don, like, let's say we move towards a more targeted thing, fully funding Pell and doing everything. Can you frame the discussion more, again, as a public good when, as Cruz, our financial aid directors here, knows we've got middle-income students above the Pell and Cal Grant lines who are being squeezed in certain ways? And we're, we've been trying to help them for a few years. How do you make that argument saleable to students in the middle and families in the middle income band that it's also a public good and they'll sure. somehow also be helped. Sure. I, I mean, I'll just briefly, I think it has begun to happen because of the primary and the debates on the left and whether it, that can sort of extend and grab the middle um, in a next administration, I think maybe. And I think that's, we should really be thinking about how how to do that. Um, so I, I would you know, want to work with what the professional communications types to, <laughs> to figure out how to do it. But I think that's, that's the, a really good question. Yeah, and reframing higher education as a public good, Greg, that's, I mean, it, it's an extremely difficult challenge. I mean, I spent most of my work that when I was a researcher and, and doing policy work focused on public higher education. And I spent a lot of time in state legislators, talking to staff, talking to the legislators. And you know, they look at this and they say, well, the benefit of going to college is making more money. Why should I subsidize that when these people are gonna benefit in 40 or 50 years of working for that? So it's extremely difficult. One of the ways I think we can help to reframe it is to remind people, and, and this gets at the issue of targeting versus universal, is remind people that pretty much every college student in America, at least in public or in public not-for-profit, is already receiving a huge subsidy. In the public institutions, it's both the combination of the state appropriation as well as the endowment that you know, many public universities have very nice endowments. In private institutions, it's endowment and other resources that's subsidizing them already. So I think reminding people of that, that there's already a fair amount of subsidy in the system and everybody's benefiting can help get at this issue of whether we can afford politically to, to further subsidize people who are lower or lower middle income as opposed to those who are upper middle income or upper income. Hey, you had a question? Hi, I'm Maggie Bowman. I'm a fellow at the Investigative Reporting Program here at UC Berkeley and doing a 
documentary project on student debt. So, oh, please, please, <laughs> <laughs> don't focus on that student who borrowed one hundred thousand dollars for a bachelor's degree. I, I, I hear, you, I hear your concern. No, Thank you. I, my my question is about the expansion of debt between 1990 and 2010, and arguably things are much better for students since. 2010, but who's going to pay the bill for that massive expansion? And we could argue about the reasons why that happened. And some of the plan, the uh, refinancing of the interest rates would address that, but it doesn't, it doesn't tackle all of it. And I think there's a question of, um, you know, in, in the case of some of these for-profits, some of them are now out of business. So are they going to pay the bill? They can't. They're not even there. Will the federal government, will the individual debtors, will the taxpayer, who, who you know, we, we can make things better from this point forward, but we have 20 years of people who suffered under this massive expansion of debt. Well, if, if, if people have paid their loans off already, they're not getting a dime back from anybody. Right. So you're yeah, talking about people who still true. have student loan debt. People, what can we because do? of these very long amortization periods that yeah. even, you know, under IBR programs, that yeah. the, the total amount paid off exceeds the principal. Let, me, quite let me just give you one data point, and then I'll let Bob uh, address this. Having the interest rate does not half somebody's monthly payments. No more than if you have your mortgage rate, it doesn't have, because most of what you're paying is going to principal. So you've already got, right now, federal Stafford subsidized loans are at 3.76%, okay? How much lower can you go? You could cut that in half and it's gonna have very little impact on somebody's monthly payments. Even somebody who's paying seven or 8% because they borrowed earlier, having that interest rate is not gonna have a huge impact on their, on their payments. But on the total amount paid back. Right? Well, now, if you want to start talking about forgiving principal, that's a very different story, and that's going to take a lot more than $500 billion over 10 years. So, so we're paying principal is a very different, very different right. issue. So I don't this, think Hillary's this, talking about the forgiving circumstances. Principal. Well, current, so current policy, there, we are going to see some significant cancellation of principal of loans of students who attended predatory schools. That are closed. Yeah. Who have schools that have closed, yeah. schools that have been found to have uh, fraudulently enrolled students. Um, and that's going to be a cost to federal taxpayers uh, program overall. Um, it will, one uh, budgetary benefit of that is that it means that when the Congressional Budget Office analyzes adding, you know, um, recreating loopholes that have been closed, they will have to include the cost of forgiving that next group of, of yeah. students' loans. So there's kind of a benefit of, you know, besides the benefit to the individual, the budget process is improved when the the externalities from the, 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 you know, the horrible things that have happened to these borrowers ends up being a taxpayer cost because it, it'll teach us the next time around um, that we shouldn't be opening up these kinds of loopholes. Um, so we are going to see, actually in the next few days, there'll be some new regulations um, around uh, something called borrower defense. So it is um, uh, borrowers who attended some of these schools, the process that they will go through to assert that their loans should be forgiven. Is Hillary talking at all, Bob, about principal forgiveness for other than people who attended I'm schools? I'm not aware of anything okay. beyond the, the programs that do exist. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, IBR I, I, and yeah. public service loan forgiveness do allow for right, some of that. Right, right. Hi, Gina Daly. I'm the campus's director of federal relations, so I'm very interested in this topic. Thank you for coming and talking about it. Um, one of the things you've just sort of touched on was Title IV eligibility. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, getting to the bad actors, uh, the, the people who have taken out quite a bit of debt for a BA, a lot of them are in the for-profit sector. Are there any parts of her plan or any movement towards trying to tighten Title IV eligibility? Because that does seem to be, you know, one of the things that I've talked about with my higher education colleagues at other campuses is that by allowing people to take out federal loans at these institutions, it's kind of telling them, this is an okay yeah. institution, you're gonna get a good education there. Yeah. Um, and as we all know, not all higher education institutions are of the same quality. So I'd, I'd be curious to hear if there's been any discussion about that. Um, and also, I've noticed politically that is a very sensitive topic um, in Congress because a lot of um, people uh, receive a lot of money from the for-profit mm -hmm. sector. So any, any uh, thoughts about that? Right. 
Um, well, Hillary Clinton has um, talked about uh, strengthening some of the already strengthened regulations around uh, for-profit colleges and their access to federal aid. Uh, there are some loopholes that have uh, not been closed. Some of the some of them require uh, congressional action. It's really interesting. I mean, Congress, as uh, helpful and supportive as Congress has been to some bad for-profit colleges, once they uh, have closed and been indicted or whatever else, suddenly they're very quiet about, <laughs> suddenly they're very quiet about those colleges yeah. uh, and no longer defending them. Um, and they just say, oh, well, you know, there's some, there's some bad actors, bad but, but, you know, but, but we're- The rest are good. The rest, the rest are, are good. Okay. And then the next um, one fails yes, and falls, and it, then the next one- uh, yeah, Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I, I'm, uh, there's been a lot of good movement on, on that. Um, uh, and Hillary's made clear that she supports all the steps that the Obama administration has taken and um, is proposing some more. And, and let's remember that, you know, the gainful employment regs do not single out the for-profit sector. I mean, they apply to a number of community colleges that have vocationally oriented programs as well. And, you know, Jorge would, would remind us of this. So we have to be prepared if the uh, Clinton administration is going to strengthen the GE regs that in fact we may find some community colleges who see that they're going to lose the potential Title IV eligibility for students in some of their programs as well. And we've got to be prepared to deal with that. Okay, final question. I think Jerry has it uh, there. Hi, it seems fairly clear from what you've been saying that the, the sources of revenue for this are, are public, either federal or state. Right. Uh, I was just wondering if there's any chance at all that there could be any private sector involvement. When I was in college, and I'll admit this was half a century ago, my roommate's father was a Ford worker. He was a factory worker. And Ford had a program where they provided scholarships to their workers' kids. Right. Does any private sector company do that? There's some of that these days, but yep. not, not a huge amount. Um, mm. so a, a lot of, I don't know if I would say a lot, some companies provide training funds for their own employees. Um, and there are, I think there are ways that, um, for example, if states have a, um, a state share requirement under a federal plan, um, encouraging states to work with employers to help meet a portion of that share, that state share, I think would be a creative and useful way of involving employers, um, reducing the hit on, on states directly. And you could even imagine in the territory um, that Don mentioned around um, other kinds of alternative post-secondary pathways, um, we need to bring back more of the job-based learning opportunities that uh, used to exist. They tended to exist more in manufacturing, and we lost manufacturing in a big way. Um, so encouraging more of that, and I think, and I'm, I'm not an expert on everything that Hillary Clinton has proposed, I think she has a tax credit proposal to promote uh, apprenticeships that goes in that direction. Um, so I think there are some, some ways that that can be promoted. All right, Hori, you, I'll let you have one quick question. You wanted to have a quick question to finalize. Yeah. Uh, this is for, primarily for, for Bob. There are three bills right now in Congress uh, relevant to risk sharing, which would be a major change in, uh, in higher education policy. Can you say anything about what you believe will be the, the probability of uh, one of those going through, particularly since Warren and Durbin are very strongly behind this, uh, Alexander's <clears throat> behind it, and if uh, the Senate and the House remain in Republican hands. Right. I suspect that they will be going forward with it. But what do you think? Um, I would. There is definitely a lot of interest in this idea of someone, universities, or some third-party entity, or something sharing in the risk of default or non-payment on student loans. It sounds like a great idea, uh, which is why a wide variety of people have said they're for it. It is really complicated to figure out how you do it well. There are a lot of negative consequences that can occur. For example, not enrolling people who you, who not giving people a chance because you're worried that they're gonna end up upsetting whatever formula your risk sharing is, is happening on. So I'm very worried about uh, 
um, those potential problems from, from risk sharing. But I would agree that um, uh, you know, I, I would put my ca myself in the category of I better become more expert on risk sharing because I do expect that it's going to come up. Um, and I, I want to be able to speak speak to the details, because I have not looked at those bills. So I'm looking forward to the paper you're putting together to help educate me about what people are thinking. And by the way, uh, Bob has a very interesting paper about the history of income contingent loans that will come out at some point. Yeah. But then, anyway. So final things I just want to say is that our discussion of free education, public education is not only isolated to the United States. Perhaps you're familiar in Chile, there's been promises without understanding the cost uh, of providing free education there after years of, of relatively minor tuition. In South Africa, there are riots at Witts University and things like this. And I think it's a very confusing and very populist aspect and the nuances that I think we did talk about here to some degree are, are lost. I can only say the one thing I would say is that I do think that uh, tuition can be too high and I'm, I'm kind of ignoring for a minute housing costs, but tuition can be too high and it can be too low. Because when things are free, you have really high attrition rates. And I think you can see that to some degree in California's community colleges, tremendous attrition rates. And that, you know it's very cheap, but you know there are good benefits to this, but you're also having different kinds of motivations by students. So that's my final thoughts. Let's give a, a round of applause for our panel. <laughs>